Hey everybody, welcome to today's Ask a Shrink. Today I want to talk about the four primary ways that victims of emotional incest use to communicate. So we all have communication styles and there's lots of books and blogs and blogs and articles and so on about how people communicate. Today I came up with four of my own that apply to victims of emotional incest because we have our own style of communicating once you've gone through a traumatic childhood. There's specific unique traits that apply to victims of emotional incest that you can kind of broaden out a little bit to victims of abuse as well. But with emotional incest, it's more about having your identity ripped from you in a very covert, misunderstood way. So we have our own styles and today I want to address that. If you're not familiar with what emotional incest is overall, when the video's over, remember this link right above, you can come back and click to it. This is where I cover in general terms what emotional incest is and how it impacts the lives of children who grow up with this kind of trauma. So the number one style of communication is that you're a people pleaser and you'll say anything in your power to soothe things over to make other people feel better. That communication style sort of permeates out into everything you do, whether it's friends, loved ones, coworkers, you're always thinking ahead to preparing yourself to how you can say something that's going to make them feel better because that was your role as a kid. You had to make the perpetrating parent feel better because they took you over as their little mini wife or mini husband. And so that role comes very naturally for you. And without some therapeutic work, it follows you into adulthood. And therefore your style is to be a people pleaser. And that comes across in the way you communicate. So you never want to argue too much. You never want to rock the boat. You want to do a lot of head nods and agreeable style and sort of go along with things. And you probably don't like conflict too much. So your style is about putting you down, you lower on the totem pole and putting others up higher on the totem pole because that's how you were trained. So this follows you into relationships. For example, if you settle down with somebody, maybe get married, generally speaking, you'll tolerate a lot that other people may not because you're a victim of emotional incest. The second style I want to point out is being passive aggressive in your communication style sometimes and then blowing up if you get pushed too far. So the passive aggressive part is because you're not good at expressing your authentic self, expressing your true feelings. You weren't able to do that as a child growing up. There's no room for it in your household. So then you began to doubt your feelings and feeling that your feelings are somehow not as important as anybody else's. So now you're an adult and let's say something comes up that you want to weigh in on and you want to give your opinion, you want to be heard about something, but you're not comfortable doing it because you're not used to it. So sometimes you may be passive aggressive about something because that's the only way you think you can get your opinion heard on a certain topic. Of course, this is not really true and therapy and working on yourself will help you see that in life, but still it's a definite communication style. So you're afraid to just come out and announce how you feel quite often. Take a stand, be seen, be visible, stand up for what you feel, for what you believe. And because you're not comfortable with that, you want to get your opinion heard. So you'll do it in a more roundabout way, coming in from the back door, so to speak. So you find a safe way to kind of get back at somebody or be heard or announce an opinion that you think is not going to be too popular with others. And that's a cowardly way to go through life. However, as victims of emotional incest, we have to realize that we do that. That's common. So catch yourself on it is the way to work with it. And don't let yourself succumb to that as an adult. You have to practice finding your voice and being authentic. Now, at the same time, tying into this, because you haven't had practice as a child, finding the gray area, understanding that people can have conflict, it can be resolved, you still love each other. You weren't allowed to have that as a child, remember? You had to always be invisible, kind of like the wallflower, because you just had to be there to serve the parent who was emotionally smothering you. So because of that, you don't have the training for letting out passionate, angry, or upset in general, because it frightens you. You know, if we're not used to working through conflict and processing it, then those feelings can kind of scare us. And so we keep everything in, but then something may push you and then it'll erupt. There'll be this volcanic eruption sometimes because that's the only way we know how to deal with our feelings. Again, from not having a role model for us as young children, that it's okay to be angry. Mom or dad will still love you if you're angry, son or daughter. These messages were not given to us. So we think we're not going to be loved if we disagree with somebody or get upset with somebody. 
And then that becomes so frightening that when we do erupt, we erupt big time because it's all we really know how to do. And then it's self-preservation at that point sometimes. It feels like do or die, flight or fight. And so then we'll have these enormous reactions, perhaps even temper tantrums because we haven't been able to practice working through the feelings that are upsetting to us and knowing that we can still love ourselves and be loved from other people if we do reveal that side of ourselves. The number three style of communication is you don't communicate or you're afraid to communicate because you haven't found your voice yet and so you're basically afraid to speak. You haven't had the opportunity when you were younger to get to know your feelings, just honor what they are and then once you're comfortable with that because you can't be comfortable with somebody who's smothering you, then you have to find the words to voice that. That can be kind of risky, right? So the part of development where a child learns to find their voice and express it in a healthy way has all been cut off. You have not been able to work on that at all. So you've just gotten really good at mm, keeping a lot in in your life. And if you do speak up sometimes or try, you may stammer and stumble and not get your point across real well because you're not used to it. You weren't allowed to do that with the two most primary important people in your life. If you're raised in a two-parent family, that would be with your mother and father. So if you haven't had the training with your own mom and dad, you're not going to be able to do that well as an adult unless you've had some therapy. So finding your voice also implies, as I just mentioned, knowing your feelings. So in order to find your voice, you got to know what you're feeling. You have to know what you're all about. You know that saying from the 1960s, find yourself. Well, it's true. That saying does apply to people who don't know their own feelings because they've blocked their feelings for so long. And then in knowing our feelings and understanding ourselves, then we can find our voice, which means we're able to verbalize in a way where we feel good and positive about ourselves and honor ourselves, honor our feelings. And that's how we grow self-esteem and self-identity. And those are all the things we were denied when we were kids. And the last and fourth style I'll mention is when you do reveal or you do open up to somebody, you reveal everything. Now, the reason this is important is, again, because it's not the gray area. We haven't had the training to pick and choose what's appropriate to realize, hmm, this is worth sharing. This is worth keeping in. This may be valuable to the conversation or this probably is not so valuable to the conversation because there hasn't been a lot of practice with that. When something does happen and, and you're confronted or you're having problems in your relationship or you're, you're arguing with a friend or you can't seem to find the middle ground with your coworkers or your neighbors getting on your last nerve. So when these things come and they come to a head, you just reveal everything. You just spill all your guts and let everything out because that's the only survival technique you know in a way, if you want to call it a survival technique, it's black or white for you. It's all or nothing. And that's because growing up as a kid, that's how it felt. It was all or nothing. You either played the role and were subservient to the smothering parent, or you would do something drastic as a way to numb the feelings. So everything is very black and white in a way that was learned from childhood. And so consequently, as an adult, when things do come up, you may reveal way too much and later on you're thinking, oh my gosh, why did I tell him all that? Why did I give him my whole childhood history? So that's that fine tuning that we didn't get as kids, but you can fine tune it as an adult and that's by finding your voice, understanding what your feelings are all about, practicing, challenging yourself, realizing none of this is your fault. It all stems from the fact that you were emotionally smothered by a parent who for their own benefit took you over for their own need. So these are just my own four styles that I came up with on my own. They're not based on any studies at all. I'm just grouping together what's common for a lot of victims of emotional incest, including myself, and how when you're stripped of your identity as a kid growing up, how these communication styles are some of the consequences you have to deal with later in life. So please leave me some comments below. Let me know if these apply to you. Let me know if you'd like to add some too. I'm sure there's many more out there. Please subscribe to my mental health YouTube channel if you like these kind of videos. And until next week, this is Brad Shore signing off from Ask a Shrink.